If you have your Bibles, open them to 1 Samuel 26. We have been marching through the book of 1 Samuel, and we have been watching as the next anointed king, David, has sought to navigate life as the pursuit of the current king. We have seen as he has had some great moments of deference to God's spirit and leading, and we have seen him act in some very fearful and very human ways that we can relate to all too well. Chapter 26, I've entitled the message, Same Old, Same Old, because we're going to read this and we're going to go, didn't we just read this? And it is a reminder as we go through this that um, there are some things for us to pick up here in this story, even as there are some similarities even to previous texts. And so if you have your place, would you stand and let's read this together as God's word. Starting in verse 1, then the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah. And said, Is not David hiding on the hill of Hilkaliah? No, I'm going to, you know, if I could see, um, it's good too. Um, Hakila, there we go, which is before Yeshimon. So Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having with him 3,000 chosen men of Israel to search for David in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul camped in the hill of Hekalah, yep, that place, which is before Yeshimon, beside the road. And David was staying in the wilderness. Now when he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness, David sent out spies, and he knew that Saul was definitely coming. So David then arose and came to the place where Saul had camped. And David saw the place where Saul lay, and Abner the son of Ner, the commander of his army, and Saul was lying in the circle of the camp, and the people were camped around him. Then David said to Ahimelech the Hittite, and Abijah the son of uh, Zeruiah, you know, I said these so much better this morning when I was practicing, Joab's brother, saying, who will go down with me to Saul in the camp? And Abijah said, I will go down with you. And so David said to Abijah, and so David and Abijah came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping inside the circle of the camp with his spear stuck in the ground at his head. And Abner and the people were lying around him. And then Abijah said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hand. Now therefore, please let me strike him with the spear to the ground with one stroke. And I will not strike him a second time. But David said to Abijah, Do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be without guilt? David also said, As the Lord lives, surely the Lord will strike him, or his day will come that he dies, or he will go down into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But now please take the spear that is at his head and the jug of water and let us go. And so David took the spear and the jug of water beside Saul's head and they went away. And no one saw or knew it, nor did any awake. For they were all asleep because a sound of sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. Then David crossed over to the other side and stood on top of the mountain at a distance with a large area between them. And David called to the people and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Will you not answer, Abner? Then Abner replied, Who are you who calls to the king? So David said to Abner, Are you not a man? And who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not guarded your lord the king For one of the people came to destroy the king, your Lord. This thing you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, all of you must surely die. Because you did not guard your Lord, the Lord's anointed. And now see, 
where the king's spear is and the jug of water that was at his head. Then Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is this your voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my lord the king. And he also said, Why then is my lord pursuing his servant? For what have I done? Or what evil is in my hand? Now therefore, please let my lord the king listen to the words of his servant. If the lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. But if it is men, cursed are they before the lord. For they have driven me out today so that I would have no attachment with the inheritance of the lord. Saying, go serve other gods. Now then, do not let my blood fall on the ground away from the presence of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to search for a single flea, just as one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will not harm you again, because my life was precious in your sight this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have committed a serious error. David replied, Behold, the spear of the king. Now let one of the young men come over and take it. The Lord will repay each man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered you into my hand today, but I refuse to stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And so now behold, as your life was highly valued in my sight this day, so may my life be highly valued in the sight of the Lord. And may he deliver me from all distress. Then Saul said to David, Blessed are you, my son. You will both accomplish much and surely prevail. And so David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. Father, as we read your word, as we allow it to wash over us today, I pray that as your people, as your bride, that the washing of the word would be that which presents it and us more and more holy, more and more in tune with who you are and your ways, more and more willing to lay down our lives on behalf of the one who has laid down his life for us. Father, as we open your word, I pray that, Spirit, you would teach and you would draw us in. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. So chapter 26 Same old, same old. You know, sometimes life seems to be stuck on the struggle bus repeat. Uh, You may relate to David here. Um, Things just seem hard and they don't get any better. This is, let's just repeat, right? This sounds so familiar. The same rats ratting him out, the same ruler, the same region, and now the same results again. In chapter 23, you just flip back a couple chapters, 19 through 29, David is let off, um, is told and uncovered by the Ziphites, is in pursuit. But if you remember, in that case, as he pursued, the Philistines came, raided, and drew Saul's attention, and David was able to narrowly escape. Chapter 24, Saul is again on the hunt. This time, he goes to relieve himself in the cave, and David is the one who comes and cuts off the part of the robe, shows it to him. And so now what we basically have are those two stories put together into one story again. So we are on repeat here for us to see. But this time, David does things just a little differently. He goes on the offensive. David's a little wiser this time. Instead of being trapped and almost captured, he heads them off first. He doesn't flee to be tracked down. He moves to confront and to head them off. He moves to get the upper hand quickly and he addresses the threat on his terms and not the pursuers. And you got to love his partner's zeal. Let's do it, David. Together we will end this here and now I will go with you. Let's go. But notice that David doesn't necessarily let him know exactly what's going on. And so David brings a moment. They go. Abishai says to David, when they arrive, today God has delivered your enemy into your hand. Let me strike him with the spear to the ground with one stroke. 
I love this next line. I will strike him. I will not strike him a second time. I'm good, David. You give me one shot. I'll take him out. But David says the same words that we were familiar with in the last chapter. I will not strike the Lord's anointed. His partner sees the fortuitous situation granted them and wants to seize the moment. Um, You can imagine him saying, David, you know that spear that Saul has been throwing at you over and over again and missing? Guess what I can do with it? I can put it through his head, and I won't miss, and I only need one chance to do it. And yet, David calms him again. I want you to see this. Regardless of how shrouded God's ways might be, it's our job to remain responsible to his revealed will. David was in a tight jam, constantly being pursued by Saul. But how he would see God bring about his ultimate deliverance and the new kingdom was on God's timing and in God's prerogative. All David knew was that it wasn't supposed to be self-reached. David was to do what he knew was right, and that was to not strike the Lord's anointed. One uh, commentator said this, David did not know how providence would work, but he knew what obedience required. Regardless of how God desired to draw up Saul's end, David knew that he was only required to stay faithful to what had been revealed to him in God's word from God himself. In fact, we have a verse like that in Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever that we may observe all the words of this law. The commentator went on to say, God's ways will frequently baffle us, but God's will is is sufficiently clear to lead us in the meantime. God's ways may not be clear, but our way is at least enough of it to know what obedience requires. I want you to think about things in your life where you don't necessarily know how God's going to work it all out. Maybe it's a financial strain, but what it doesn't mean In the midst of God working that out, it doesn't mean that we are allowed to cheat, lie, or swindle to get out of it. Maybe it's marital stress, but it doesn't mean that we can seek satisfaction elsewhere while we wonder how God might fix it. Maybe it's job stress, but it doesn't mean that we fall in line and do what everybody else does because that's our industry's standard practice. You see, David, even in in verse 10, begins to wonder, how is God going to do it? Is Saul like going to die like Nabal in the last chapter where God just kind of like, whoop, 10 days later, he's dead? Will it be like Samuel, who we just read about, who died just basically of old age? Or will it be like Eli's sons who will go down in battle? David allows for the conversation, but in all times, at all times, he's putting that in submission to what he knows is his role in that moment. Regardless of how God would choose to end it for Saul, David is content that it will be God who ends it for Saul and not him. Just because someone else is willing to do the dirty work for us doesn't mean we aren't responsible. So notice Abishai, he realizes that David is not going to do it. He looks at David and he says, hey, Dave, let me do it. I, I can do it. I can take the spear. I can kill the guy. It'll be over. All of our running, all of our hiding, all of the trying to find provisions, all of these things, just let me do the dirty work for you, David, and then you can rise to the kingship which you deserve. He's willing to do it for him. And can I just ask a question for us today? Are we willing too often to let others sin for us so that we get the benefits derived while seemingly keeping our own hands clean? I've heard people say, that's that's just between them and the Lord. It's not my responsibility. That might be as simple as the Kroger employee who gives you a break that you didn't deserve on Kroger's dime not their own. It may be dealing under the table to avoid taxes or annoying extra costs. 
I'm building a house right now. I deliberated, will I get a building permit or not? I got one. Do you know what that means for me? Red tape. It means four structural beams that I now have to put in place in my house and four footers in my crawl space. It means thousands of dollars to get that done. It means timing is changed. It is going to cost me time and more than a couple thousand dollars to do all of that. But at the same time, my HVAC guy, I didn't realize this when he did it, but he pulled the permit and he just pulled a replacement permit, not a renovation permit, to let everybody in on that. Replacements, when they just switch it out and leave the ductwork where it was, well, my ductwork wasn't there. I should have taken clue that he had done something that was probably a little sketchy when I looked at my crawl space and all the other ductwork was gone because he didn't want anybody to see it because he put new ductwork in. But what that means is he has to have it inspected. They have to do the thermal testing and the air gaps and all that kind of stuff. It's more paperwork for him, and so it's going to cost me more. And so he's like, you can save a 1000 bucks easily because I don't have to go through all of that if we just file the permit this way. Well, getting the building permit, that was basically me saying, no, we're going to do it the other way, even though it costs money. But it's sometimes really easy just to say, oh, yeah, okay, cool. Thanks. I don't necessarily have to do it the right way. David looks at his partner and says, oh, well, if I don't kill him and he's dead, well, how about that? We kind of all get to where we're supposed to go, and no one's worse for the wear. I think that's a really applicable thing for us. Too often we're willing to let other people do the dirty work, and then we reap the, we reap the quote-unquote benefits, or maybe we should say consequences of it. But instead, we are to be like David. We must persevere in doing good. It's one of the amazing things I, I, I just keep going back to in these passages is David's heart stays so tender. He, he just continues to do good towards Saul. He is patient. He trusts the Lord. He would not nor allow anyone else with him to raise a hand against Saul, no matter how many times Saul keeps coming after him, no matter how many times Saul keeps lying to him. David's weariness could have easily have worn him down into giving in to taking matters into his own hands. We are on repeat over and over, and how patient can one man be expected to be? And the answer is evidently pretty patient. And the question comes to us, are we able to endure people who seemingly never change their failures and continually cause us the same headaches? How do you do with those kinds of people in your life? Do they get so aggravating and annoying that you either give in or avoid or stop acting like Jesus? The fruit of the Spirit is supposed to be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Oh, oh. So says the song. Do you know when the Spirit is seen evidently in your life? It's when you get the rub in life. That's when the Spirit's on display. The Spirit's attributes are best seen when it is in contrast when they are in contrast to the world's expectations. And so David has time and time again moments to let his sweetness, his tenderness to the Lord be on display because the rub is real. We can talk about how we got love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and faithfulness, and self-control all we want to until we get confronted with people that we can't love and have no joy with and no peace and patience and kindness with because then we get out of control. Right? And so that's the, the, the common joke is don't pray that God gives you patience because he's going to send you someone to aggravate the snot out of you. This is, this is David 
showing us why he's a man after God's own heart because he's tender towards the Lord's anointed even though the Lord's anointed says, oh, you're right, come back to me, I won't do it. Next chapter, I'm coming back. I mean, at some point, when do we get to stop banging our heads against the, the wall and say enough is enough? There are people who will seemingly continue to have a character that will grade you, a behavior which will over and over annoy you, a disposition that wears you, a sin issue which frustrates you. And so how are you doing with those people? Is God on display or is your flesh a whole lot more noticeable? David stayed gracious towards Saul even after continued non-repentant pursuing. He endured Saul's static demise. But it didn't mean that he walked into danger for nothing. There was a plan. He says to Abishai, he says, take the spear and the jug of water and let's go. And so they, here they come and they, they're, did you notice they have like a full-fledged conversation? There's 3,000 men that are sleeping right there with Saul in the middle and they're having a conversation. How does that even happen? Well, the narrator actually helps you learn why that happens. He tells you, because the Lord had brought a sound sleep and it had fallen on them. One of the things that I want to just remind you of is as you trust the Lord, the Lord is working. He is always at work. Whether you see it clearly or not, God is always at work. Here the narrator clues us into this very fact. He answers the question, how can this happen? Like, how can they be in a cave and having a conversation while Saul is relieving himself, and yet they have this moment? God is working in David's life and on his behalf. The Lord's favor and his providence is on display here. He's actively preserving David. David's no dummy. David lives in light of God's favor, but he also, before he opens his mouth, he doesn't wake up and say, hey, Saul, I'm right here. I like what the verse says. If you go and look at it, it says, then David crossed over to the other side and stood on the top of the mountain at a distance with a large area between them. <laughs> he ain't dumb. He may be brave, but he ain't dumb. So he gets this nice distance away. Hey, Abner! And he calls to Abner and confronts them. He calls, and I, I mean, this is indicting. The reality is, because these men had stolen these things and could have taken the life of the king, literally all those men should die. They could be taken back and killed. They failed in their obligation to protect King Saul. He points to Abner and says, do you not realize one of the people came to destroy the king, your Lord, tonight? And you know what's ironic? Where Abner failed to protect the king, David was actually the one who did it. David looked at his partner and said, no, we're not doing that. So here David is inciting the one who is supposed to be in that position, saying, no, I'm actually the one who did that. The spear and the jug, the evidence, and make it clear. The commentator wrote this. He said, for all his protection, Abner plus 3,000 men, Saul is defenseless. The om omnipresent symbol, symbol of his power had been effortlessly pilfered. David had disarmed Saul. And that would be a sign for Saul, but also for David. The commentary goes on to say, David should receive that as an encouragement, as an assuring token from God. God tends to be that kind of God, one who reaches out to his tired and wearied servants, and in the midst of their discouragement, grants them some plain token, some small evidence that he's not forgotten his word and his promises to them. This moment is a reminder to David that God is taking care of him, that God will bring about these things. And in this moment of he's got to be exhausted and yet he's persevering with the Lord, the Lord says, I'm taking care of you. I've got you, David. Saul recognizes the voice. Is that you, 
my son David? Yeah, it's me, Dad. Notice the word he actually use, uses twice. He says, um, why then is my Lord pursuing his servant? Then later on, he says in verse 19, now therefore, please let the Lord, the king, listen to the words of his servant. The last time he addressed Saul, he didn't use the word servant. But let's go back one chapter. There's a guy named Nabal going, who is this man? These men may well be servants who have run away from their masters. And that's why I'm not going to share anything with them. I can't trust them. He's coming back and he's saying, no, I'm still the man that I'm supposed to be. I'm doing it as best I can with the man, with my Lord trying to kill me. Still, I am your servant. David knows that the Lord hasn't stirred Saul against him. He says, if the Lord is what has stirred you, then let me offer something. But there is no offering that is needed. There is no breach in this area. David is in the Lord's favor. Even as it is evident in this moment by God's sleep that he brought over Saul and his men and by the protection over David and Abishai. The answer there is clear. And so the second option must be the right one. And so whether it's his men or Saul himself, they are to blame before the Lord for driving David away. Look what he says. These men have, because of these men or you, you have driven me out today so that I would have no attachment with the inheritance of the Lord. Almost as if you're saying to me, go, leave here, serve other gods, depart from us, get out of here. We don't want you. Verse 20 don't let my blood fall to the ground away from the presence of the Lord. What is David talking about here? Obviously, we know that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. Does David really believe that God's only in Israel alone? No, he understands. But what he wants to be is where God's promises are and where God's presence is most manifest. Israel was the promised land as an inheritance, and it was the dwelling place of God in his tabernacle. David's heart ached and longed to be in God's promises and able to worship in God's house in his presence. The question for us, is our heart tender enough towards the Lord that our brokenness is more over that which keeps us from being present in the Lord's promises and in his presence, experiencing his worship, than in just self-preserving ourselves? And so the question for us is this, in whose hands are you entrusting yourself? As it comes to an end, Saul says, I've sinned, return, my son, I will not harm you. David replies, I'm not coming back over there. You can send one of the young men over here to get the, the spear and the jug, but I'm not coming back, Dad. He says in verse 23, the Lord will repay each man for his righteousness and his faithfulness, the Lord delivered you into my hands, but I refuse to stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And listen to what he says. Now behold, as your life was highly valued in my sight this day, so may my life be highly valued, not in your sight, but in the sight of the Lord. And may be, he be the one who delivers me from all distress. Saul drums the same tune. No evidence of true or lasting change. And David seems to ignore that offer. He turns instead, repeating his innocence and calling on the Lord for vindication. He doesn't ask for Saul to value him as he has valued him. Rather, he invokes God. It is God who will bring the deliverance and the relief, not Saul. And so verse 25, David goes his way and Saul returns to his place. And for those that are tired of Saul chasing David, this is the last time they see each other. They will not see each other again. Saul will die. David will become king. But it is not because of David. The final admittance, blessed are you, my son. You will both accomplish much, and you will surely prevail. It is exactly what David will do. And I just want to point forward now and let David point us to Jesus, because it's Palm Sunday. As David endured Saul, Jesus, our Savior, would one day come and patiently endure the people, as fickle as they were too. 
the crowds on Palm Sunday would praise him and then give way to the next crowds which would mock him. Like Saul, the heart of humanity would not truly be changed. Jesus' presence in Israel, much like David's for Saul, was the enemy's ever-present reminder that his and humanity's kingdoms were soon to be judged and replaced. But instead of delivering his son out of their hands, by week's end, God would deliver his anointed over into their hands. And unlike David, instead of sparing him, he would deliver him to be killed. The son's kingdom was going to be established but not because of the death of the previous king, per se, but instead by his own death in their place. Just as God would eventually hand over the kingdom to David, having removed the previous king and the obstacles in his way, so God would raise Jesus and give him his kingdom, having canceled the debt and overcome all obstacles. And so this week, that's what we prepare for. Jesus is going to Jerusalem not to evade his pursuers, but to confront them, to submit to God's predetermined plan, seemingly losing to them by dying on the cross, whereby he instead will win the victories and be given the greatest of kingdoms. He who entrusts himself just as David did, that God the Father would bring about his perfect will through his perfect ways. And the question, and the illustration for us, and the reminder for us today is, do you trust God like that? Do you trust the Lord? Or are you still living the same old, same old? Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for the picture of David and the perseverance in doing, in doing good entrusting himself to you. Lord, thank you for the tenderness with which he lived his life and the way that he honored you and committed his ways to you, even when he did not understand exactly how you would bring them to bear on his life. He knew the promises and he knew that you would, and so he waited. He let you lead he did not take advantage of the circumstances or situations. He did not play them to his ends. He stood strong. He challenged where he needed to, but he lived by faith. Father, I thank you for Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect, sinless life, who being divinity became humanity. As we reflect over that, this coming week, and we are reminded that he fought all the same battles and won perfectly in all of them, even surrendering himself on a cross, satisfying your will for him and satisfying your wrath for us. Father, as we turn our affections and our attentions this week to Easter, I pray you help us to see you. God, don't leave us looking like the world. Don't leave us in the same old, same old. Don't leave us taking advantage of circumstances, but let us live differently because Christ is alive and your spirit indwells us and he calls us to a holiness, to a righteousness, and he empowers us to see that lived out, that his fruit would be on display Thank you for your word. Would you allow it to transform us today in Jesus' name? Amen.